Hi, this is Ms. Howell. We're going to move on to Module 10. This is the endocrine system, and that basically is the system that handles your hormones. This is only going to be a one-week lesson. Um, we've divided all the others into two, but this one's pretty quick. And so we're just going to do everything in one week and be done with it and move on. So because this is only one lesson, I'm going to fly through this as always, and I want you to look for the words in red and look for the stars that are listed so they'll help you with your test. My dog is in the background barking so I apologize if that sound gets picked up on the tape. So let's get going. The endocrine system includes all your hormones. The endocrine system works along with your nervous system to regulate your body's metabolism, growth and development, tissue function, sexual function, reproduction, your sleep, your mood, and some other things as well. There are two Greek words that combine to form the word endocrine. So the first part of the word endo means within and krino means to separate or separate or apart from. So this helps us to define what the endocrine system is. The system involves the secretions of chemicals or as we said hormones that actually control tissues of your body that are far away or separate from where they are secreted. If you remember, we learned a long time ago that the cells of the central nervous system can't be repaired if they're damaged, but that's not true of the endocrine system. The endocrine system is instead composed of glands and organs. Glands are made of epithelial tissue, and epithelial tissue does have a mechanism to repair itself. The endocrine system's function begins with the actual endocrine gland. There are primarily eight of those within the body. Um, you'll see the list of those in just a moment. The gland, whichever one we're talking about, will synthesize whatever hormone we need and it might store it for later use or it will immediately release that hormone right away into the blood. The circulatory system of your body that's your blood vessels, it's like a superhighway, and the blood transports the hormone away from the endocrine gland to the target cells. Some hormones have to hitch a ride on a carrier protein because they're not able to mix in with the blood directly. Eventually, the hormone is released from the blood near the target cells, and those that have the appropriate receptors are the target cells that are able to absorb the hormone. The endocrine system operates with a feedback system. All that means is that the target cell sends messages back to the original gland to let it know if the job is complete or if they need more, more hormones to get the job done. Hormones that are finished or no longer needed or have already been used are eliminated from your body in one of two ways. The kidneys excrete your hormones in urine and the liver processes them and sends them out through bile into the intestines where they're excreted in your stool. So this picture is similar to the one in your book but you do need to focus on the one in your book um, as you're uh, studying for your test because your test will have a diagram on it that matches the one in the textbook. So make sure you can identify each of the glands. And then we're also going to create an anchor chart that's going to help you categorize each of these endocrine glands, their organs. Uh, what I want you to do is in your guided notes you're going to fill in the second and third column. That's the hormones produced by the glands that are listed and you're also going to list the hormone function like the target tissue and what it does. And I want you to note that there are lots of glands that produce various different hormones and they all have their own specific functions and you'll see that as we move on. So as I go through these slides I'm just going to let you pause on your own while you're filling in your your notes and just fill in these tables as you go. So in the beginning of your table in your chart there you have the hypothalamus and if you notice the hormones that are produced are hormone releasing hormones. We'll talk about what that means in a few minutes, but that is specific of the hypothalamus, that the hormones that it release um, have to do with releasing other hormones. Then you have the anterior pituitary, 
And if you remember when we were studying the brain, the pituitary had a front and a back, the anterior and the posterior sections. And some of those had to do with neurological functions. Well, they also have to do with endocrine functions. So the anterior pituitary has these specifics. You can pause this and write them down. And then the posterior pituitary has a few of its own. You also need to write down the ones for the thyroid gland the thyroid and the parathyroids. So you should have um, one large thyroid gland in your throat right in the front of your neck and then you have four parathyroids that are attached to your thyroid gland. And then you have the adrenal glands. They're located on the kidney um, on your right and left kidneys and then the adrenal gland has an inner and an outer section. The adrenal medulla is the center and the adrenal cortex is the outer layer of that adrenal gland. And then we have the pancreas. That's not a gland really, it's an organ. Um, but when we dissect at the end of the year, we're going to dissect a mammal and you'll see these organs and you'll see that the pancreas organ is really, really different. Um, but for now, just write down the insulin and glucagon and what they do. And then you've got your sexual organs, the ovaries and testes for females and males. And then back in the brain, you've got the pineal body. And then you've got the thymus, which is located in your chest. And it's involved in your immunity. All right, here's a few interesting notes that I want to add. Diabetes mellitus is caused by an interruption in the function of the pancreas. Type 1 diabetes, which is also called insulin dependent diabetes or child or juvenile onset diabetes, that's the result of the inability of the pancreas to produce insulin. And that's from the beta cells within the, the pancreas. So as a result, the cells of your body don't take in glucose. And if the cells can't take in the glucose, then that means the blood glucose levels remain abnormally high. So you have high blood sugar. Symptoms of high blood sugar or of an elevated blood glucose level would be excessive thirst, excessive hunger, an excessive need to go to the bathroom and urinate, also weakness and lethargy, which just means you're very tired. Treatment requires insulin to be given by injection because your body's not making it, so you've got to get it from a shot. Then there's type 2 diabetes, and that's often called adult onset diabetes or non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. And this is caused by cells that are no longer responsive to insulin due to few or no receptors. So your body makes insulin, but the cells don't have the receptors to be able to uh, receive the insulin so those cells aren't able to take in the glucose from your blood sugar either. Treatment for this does not need insulin. You don't need a shot because you already make insulin. So instead treatment includes diet control, limiting the amount of uh, glucose that you take in. You know, you can't have candy bars every day. Also, you need to increase your exercise and try to have a gain or a, a, a goal of weight loss uh, to get yourself back under um, the target weight for your overall age and size. Then there's this other disease called diabetes insipidus. Diabetes insipidus is not caused by the pancreas at all. It's related to too little antidiuretic hormone and that results in the kidneys putting out gallons and gallons of water or actually urine every day and this condition is very rare and treatment is just um, sadly you just have to drink lots and lots of water because your body is eliminating water at a fast rate and you would become very dehydrated which could be very dangerous also of interest is a gland called the pineal gland the pineal gland works in conjunction with your eyes when your eyes take in light the pineal gland secretes serotonin that's like the feel-good hormone and it secretes that during the daytime um, when any light is entering your eyes. When you stop detecting light, it switches. The pineal gland now secretes melatonin. So melatonin is the sleep hormone. So this pineal gland affects your sleep-wake cycle, but it also 
is involved in just feeling good in general. So on cloudy, gray, dark, gloomy days, you tend to feel more gloomy than on a bright sunny day. And that has to do with the amount of light that is taken in by your eyes and how much of this serotonin or feel good hormone that your uh, pineal gland produces. Um, so they have actually produced a certain light bulb that you can purchase or a certain light fixture to help with a disease or a condition called seasonal affective disorder. Some people in the months of January and February when it's more dark and gloomy and cloudy, they have this sadness or this almost depression and you can buy these bulbs that produce a brighter um, light that your eyes take in and it triggers that serotonin uh, production in your pineal glands. Another thing is, just having to do with this, I just thought of this, if you're having trouble going to sleep at night and you think that lying in bed and playing with your uh, phone, playing games on your phone is going to help you to get drowsy and fall asleep, unfortunately, even if your bedroom lights are off, the brightness of the phone, the white background especially, or bright flashes on your phone during games that you might be playing, those are triggering that serotonin and not allowing your brain to switch to the melatonin production which is what you need for sleep. So some people have to actually wear a mask over their eyes and get room darkening curtains to really block out the light so that they can sleep better at night. Hormones are chemicals that trigger responses to target cells. So as chemicals they have classifications and there's three groups. One group is called the amines and those are hormones that have been derived from an amino acid. And examples are epinephrine, norepinephrine, thyroxine, and melatonin. Another classification would be steroids. Those are hormones that are made from cholesterol. Those are mostly your um, sex hormones and also cortisol and aldosterone. And proteins or peptides are hormones that are made of protein or mini proteins, which is what peptides are, and that's all the others. So what you need to do now is pause the, the tape, go back to your chart that you filled in, and make sure you mark all of these as to which type of classification they are. So maybe to the left of the type of hormone, you can write an A for amine, an S for steroid, or a P for proteins or peptides. So what controls secretion of hormones? Well, we have three different control mechanisms. We've got non-hormonal regulation, and that means that some kind of chemical other than the hormone is what regulates the release. And insulin that we talked about is one of those, where the amount of glucose in your bloodstream stimulates the pancreas to produce insulin for you. There's direct neural control, and that means neural, meaning nervous system. So that means the nervous system is the thing that's controlling the exocrine gland. And remember fight or flight, that panic situation that releases epinephrine and norepinephrine? Well, that is a direct neural control secretion of hormone. And then the last one is how hormones secrete hormones. And I told you back in the beginning of your chart that the hypothalamus releases a number of releasing hormones so that's specific to the hypothalamus they are hormonal controlled hormones so we've worked through glands that control the secretion and the target organ response now we want to look at the pattern of secretion and this is going to be on your test so you need to just be able to look at these charts or graphs and be able to identify them so there's a constant secretion where you have some hormones that are also called pulsatile secretion that are always in your bloodstream. Your body is constantly making those. And the hypothalamus um, regulates your body temperature. So there's a constant level of hormones produced by the hypothalamus. So that's a pulsatile or constant secretion. Acute response has to do with the hormone is at a very low level generally, but then in an acute short-term potentially hazardous situation, your body rapidly produces something. And that epinephrine in the panic situation is one of those. And then the third one would be cyclic. Those are the hormones that follow regular and predictable cycles, like you girls that have regular reproductive cycle hormones. Those are the cyclic secretions of hormones. And then one last thing would be prostaglandins. So you need to write the definition. So pause your tape to write the definition for prostaglandin. 
and specifically they just increase smooth muscle contractions, increase blood clotting, and control inflammation in your tissues. So they have local effects rather than distant effects. So prostaglandins aren't really hormones, they're in their own category.